morning. Uh, I want to just thank again the people that gave their testimonies last, last week. Terry and uh, Jasmine and Johnny, they just did such a good job. And then after the, uh, after the testimonies, we had, uh, we had about three, I think, three people that were going to be baptized by the time we got down there. There were five people that wanted to be baptized. And then, and then somebody wandered up off the beach, you know, who saw us baptizing and wanted to get baptized. And she was a believer as well. And so we had a great time um, you know, sharing the Lord with people and just being a witness. The beach was packed, and uh, it was just a, a really good, great time. And so I want to encourage those that were baptized this last week. Uh, what a blessing that was. Uh, great to have you here. I know that some of you are visiting. I hope that your stay on the island is pleasant and enjoyable, and God uses it for um, building you up and causing you growth in the Lord. And uh, for those of you that are regulars here, welcome back. It's nice to see you. I um, want to encourage you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 14. And uh, I feel really blessed this morning. I think we've got at least three pastors here this morning. I asked them all if they wanted to teach, and they all declined. I don't blame them. Um, but the good news, if I have a heart attack right now, there's some backup. So really happy about that. Matthew chapter 14, walking on water. A great text. I'm, I'm uh, praying that God's going to use it to encourage you this morning and uh, be a blessing to you that you would be built up, strengthened in your faith. And, uh, and leave this place with the comfort and the peace of God in your heart. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come over to you on the water. And so he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When they crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, and when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that region and brought to him all who were sick and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Father, we thank you for uh, the privilege of gathering and studying your word, worshiping, Lord, enjoying sweet fellowship together. And uh, we want to we say thank you, God, for this particular text. It's, uh, it's not a coincidence that we're studying this today. It's um, the, all the people you want to have here are here. Our hearts and minds are open. But we're praying, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us. Uh, because this is a divine appointment we're, we're having and we've entered into. And so there's something that you want to say. There's a response uh, that's appropriate for us to give. And we want to be changed. We want to be encouraged. We want to have increased faith, Lord. And we want to walk with you. And so I'm praying that you would use this this morning to, to touch and encourage uh, all of us, Lord, whether we're going through great times or difficult times. And so, Holy Spirit, take your word and use it to advance, to exalt, and to reveal the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. This is a, a wonderful text of Scripture, um, a lot of different ways to develop it and to share it. But I want to back up before we get into the text itself and, and give you some context. Uh, Matthew, of course, one of, the, one of the disciples writing this gospel, has presented Jesus Christ as the authenticated, promised Messiah of God. The Jews, unfortunately, have rejected this uh, authenticated Messiah of God and, in fact, have ridiculed him, have persecuted him, have demonized him and went so far as to commit uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit uh, in their rejection of Jesus Christ. But in the midst of that, Jesus never stopped teaching, he never stopped preaching, and he never stopped proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a few weeks ago, we talked about the importance of sowing in tears. 
because in due time you're going to reap a harvest if you don't give up. And so I want to encourage you again today, if, if you're going through some hardship or some difficulty in your walk with God and serving him, is keep sowing good seed because in due time you're going to reap a harvest. And that was the great example of Jesus Christ in the midst of all this suffering and persecution and slander is that he kept sowing, never giving up. But in the midst of this, we find in the text that uh, Herod, the tetrarch, has actually taken the head of John the Baptist. This is Jesus' cousin and the forerunner of the Messiah. And that was devastating to the Lord. Um, he was God, but in the flesh, and experienced emotions. He wept, he grieved, he mourned, and certainly that was the case when his cousin was brutally uh, martyred. And in the midst of that, Jesus tries to get away by himself, but he's interrupted in his first effort by a group of 5,000 men, plus women and children, somewhere between 15 and 30,000 people, came to hear Jesus teach, and they needed something from him, even though he needed something from the Father. And in the midst of that, he served that group of people. And then having finished that, now we find him in the text trying to get away again and is interrupted again by a very unusual storm, maybe common in some respects, but I think the text will reveal that this may have uh, uh, demonic origins as a result of, um, of the things that Satan was trying to do to disrupt the work of God. And I guess my, my first observation I want to make in this text and just kind of bring to your attention is that here are the disciples in the boat at the command of Jesus doing exactly what he wanted them to do in the right place at the right time and in a giant storm. And that's a little hard for us to wrap our minds around. And some of you are in that place right now or you've been there or you're going there where you're doing exactly what God wants you to do and you find, surprisingly, a storm. We have this misconception that if we follow Christ and if we obey the Lord and if we honor God, that everything is going to be smooth sailing. And this text is a, is a reminder that that's not always true. So we begin in, in verse 22 with this uh, disrupted plan. Immediately, the text tells us, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat after this great work of feeding the 5,000. Uh, they go bef before him to the other side, which was the plan. And uh, he sent the multitudes away, and then he went out on the mountainside by himself to pray, uh, which Luke tells us is, was a frequent uh, pattern of his life. We have lots of examples of Jesus getting away to pray. And obviously, the Messiah modeling this gives us a pretty good idea of how important it is for us to be people of prayer. C.S. Lewis has said this about prayer. He says, the moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists in shoving it all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. And C.S. Lewis wrote this before iPhone and before Facebook, which seems to be the thing that often rushes into our life before anything else. But we find Jesus being renewed. We find him uh, experiencing comfort and peace and wisdom and strength and power and direction as he communed with his father uh, in isolation on the mountain. Well, the text in verse 24 tells us that while Jesus was doing this, the boat was in the middle of the sea. This particular sea, the Sea of Galilee, is, is also called the Sea of Chenereth. It's also called uh, the Lake Gennesaret. It's 13 miles long. It's 7 miles wide. It's 700 feet below sea level. It's known for its violent and, and unexpected storms that take place frequently on that particular lake. And it was on this lake that the disciples were rowing across, and the text tells us that they were tossed by the waves. Now, uh, the Greek is basin, uh, basinizo, which means to torture or to vex. And interestingly, this is the same word that the text of Scripture in the book of Matthew uses to describe someone, in fact, a number of people in, uh, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, who were actually being tortured and tormented by demons. So the same word is used to describe this boat that's being tortured on the water in the same way that a de demon might torture someone that that demon had possessed. 
I find that very interesting because in, uh, in the book of, uh, of Matthew, we've also encountered a previous storm where Jesus was sleeping on the boat. Remember that story? They're fishing. Jesus was sleeping on the boat. They're afraid they're going to sink. And that particular storm, without covering too much territory here, uh, we discovered was quite likely demonic in origin because it wasn't just a storm, but there was a, it was a seismos. It was an earthquake. And those events, I believe, were were designed by the enemy to sink the boat with Jesus and the disciples. Now the disciples are crossing, and Satan behind the scenes is constantly working. Even though we don't see his name on every page of Scripture, he's constantly strategizing how to disrupt and ruin and damage and destroy the work of God. And so these disciples, without Christ, who's on the mountain praying, are facing a very difficult time going across the sea. The winds were contrary, oppositional, antagonistic. As I, as I think about this text, it kind of draws me back to the thing that I started with. I guess a couple of points that I'd like to make as observation. The first is that following Jesus doesn't exempt us from life's storms. That's just the reality. But in 1 Peter, Peter is talking about storms in a church that's being persecuted. And he tells the church, don't be surprised when you face trials of various kinds. Now, why would we be surprised that we face trials. Jesus said you're going to have trouble in this world. We live in a fallen world. The world is filled with sin, sometimes our own, sometimes other people's sin, and, and we suffer under the weight of, of that corruption that came as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And so we, we struggle with that, but somehow as Christians, we, we have this hope that if we walk with God and we do everything that God wants us to do, that we are going to avoid the possibility of storms. And yet here we find the disciples in the very center of the will of God, in the, in the center of a big storm. The second thing that, that strikes me on this text is that they actually uh, were experiencing this right in the middle of an act of obedience. So it's not just that they're in the will of God, but they're actually obeying God and in the midst of that suffering. Now again, this shouldn't surprise us, but that, again, Peter has to say, don't be surprised. And my encouragement to you this morning is that if you're in the will of God, and if you are obeying God, you can expect that you sometimes are going to suffer. Sometimes you're going to be blessed and it'll just be a free ride and clear direction and, and uh, the wind's going to be at your back and the current's going to be moving with you. But there will be times that the enemy is oppositional. The text doesn't tell us what the source of this storm is. Is it demonic? Is it God? We know that God has caused storms in the Bible. Or is it just nature? We're not even told in the Scripture but the wonderful promise that we have in the Word of God is that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to His purpose. So at the end of the day, if we can't figure out the source of the storm, it doesn't really matter because God in His sovereignty, whether it's demonic or whether it's just human nature or whether it's natural disaster, whatever it might be, at the bottom of all of that pile of, of confusion and sometimes anxiety, Romans 8.28 comes to play. And it says, all things, all things under all circumstances work together for the good of those. But it's for those that love God, those that love Him, are in obedience to Him, are doing His will, and are called according to His purpose. What's His purpose? Advancing the kingdom of God. That promise isn't for carnal Christians. That promise isn't for compromising people that don't want to walk with God and violate the biblical premise of the Word of God, that walk away from God, that, that live their own life their own way. This is for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Those men, those women, those young people can be confident that all things will work together for the good for them. Well, I've, I've entitled this next uh, section, The Expert Waterman. Uh, you know, we have a lot of great watermen on Kauai. Uh, we also have uh, what are considered Brahms, you know, young, young guys that are coming up. We've also got kooks. I couldn't bring myself to name the disciples kooks. These are novices, people that really don't know anything about surfing, and they're out there on their board, and their board's like that, and they're paddling along, and they're just lost. They don't know what they're doing. But we have an expert waterman in Jesus Christ in, in verse 25. In the fourth watch of the night, we're told, uh, he went out to the disciples. This is somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. That's the fourth watch. And it's during the darkest and the hardest hours of the night when something unexpected happened because Jesus started walking on the sea. Now, there are three things that I want to I highlight that, that uh, give us an understanding of who Jesus is by virtue of the fact that he's actually walking on water, because this is a really big deal. 
the first thing that this tells us prophetically from the book of Job is that Jesus is God. That's the first thing it tells us. You may not be familiar with this passage, but in Job chapter 9, verses 7 and 8, speaking of God, Job says this. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone, referring to God, stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. This is prophetic of the work and ministry of Jesus Christ. The second thing that we know besides the fact that he's God is that God takes notice, uh, notice of our suffering. That's really comforting to me. It should be to you as well. In Exodus, when the people of Israel were under the oppression of the Egyptians, the Bible says in, in Exodus chapter 3 that the Lord said to the people, I have surely seen the op oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And with a group of people this size, undoubtedly some of you are asking the question, does God care? Does God see? Does he even know what I'm going through? Does it matter to him? Uh, how come he's so silent? Why am I not hearing? Why is he not acting? And we have this text of Scripture uh, that shows again and again throughout the Bible, now in this particular instance, that Jesus takes notice of suffering. The third thing that we know about Jesus is that he comes to us in our hour of need, as he did with the disciples, as he did with the people of Israel, as he does with us. In Isaiah 43, it says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So three things that we can find out from Jesus just walking on the water. He's God, he notices our suffering, and he comes to us in our hour of need. And when he saw the disciples, uh, the verse tells us in verse 26 that they were troubled and that they thought it was a ghost, a phantasma is the Greek word here, and it means an apparition, a spirit. Uh, superstition was common in Jesus' day. Even the uh, spiritual leaders had uh, pagan beliefs about, about ghosts. And Herod the Tatriarch had just thought that, that, that Jesus was the resurrected John the Baptist. And so thinking of ghosts was fairly common in that time. And they thought it was a ghost. And because they did, they cried out in fear. But in verse 27, Jesus immediately said, be of good cheer. I, I, um, I, like, I like the calmness of God. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But when we get panicky and anxious and frantic, God's calm. God's never not calm. God may get angry, but he's calm. God is completely self-controlled. He never is a, at, a, at a loss of what to do or what to say. Um, he is the picture of peace, even when we're not. And in the midst of that, he tells the disciples in his peace to be of good cheer. There's lots of reasons why, why the Lord can say that, <clears throat> not the least of which is he knows the end of the story. He knows his power. And he knows what's at stake. And he knows the end of the story. But there are three reasons in the Bible and three occasions when, when Jesus said to people, be of good cheer. And they're connected some, to some promises that are really meaningful for us. And I think they'll be uh, meaningful to you as well. In, in Psalm 27, the Lord said to, or David said of the Lord, that those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And, and the context of that, he says, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. If you wait on God, God will redeem. God will deliver. God will rescue. God will save. So that same concept. Because of that, be of good cheer. As you're waiting, be of good cheer because you know your Redeemer. Jesus in, uh, in John 14 said that, be of good cheer. I'm preparing a place for you. He's preparing a place because this place is going to be renovated. At, at, at best, renovation at, uh, you know, uh, another possibility is completely new. Something never seen before. That's a possibility as well. But in any case, God sees fit that he's going to do a renovation. You know, we're watching McDonald's get renovated down there. And I'm thinking, I'm driving by and I'm thinking, oh, they're going to clean it up and they're going to retile and they're going to, you know, put a new kitchen in. It's going to be clean. It's going to be nice. And then I drive by and there's no McDonald's there. Did you guys notice that? Because sometimes you just have to do a teardown. And Jesus, in essence, is going to do a teardown. And the reason is, is because this place has been so corrupted and so damaged that God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and he's building a place for you. 
And Jesus says, put your hope on that. See, we want to have everything fixed right now. We want to be free right now. We want a peaceful life right now. We don't want to suffer right now. But Jesus says, be of good cheer. I'm preparing a place for you. In John 16, he says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know, sometimes we feel like the world's overcoming us. But Jesus says, oh, no, I'm overcoming it. And you're a part of my family. You're part of my bride. And he, then he says something really interesting. He says, it is I. Be of good cheer. It is I. This is another reason we can be of good cheer. God's with us. God incarnate is with us. An emphatic personal pronoun, which actually means in the Greek, it is I myself to the, ex- ex- to the exclusion of all others. It is I myself and no other, Jesus says. He says that quite frequently in Scripture. I'm the bread of life. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I, to the exclusion of all others, Jesus says, am with you. And don't be afraid. I I really like a a particular verse in Isaiah 41.10. Some of you are familiar with it, but it's really the remedy for fear. He says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's the remedy. Do not fear. I am with you. God, in the midst of your challenge, your marriage, your kids, your finances, your health, uh, your extended family, whatever's going on in your job, in the midst of that, God is with you. I will say this. One of the worst things that can happen when you're in a storm is panic. And panic leads to making bad decisions. And one of the, one of the principles of, of counseling uh, when people are in a storm is to make sure that people don't do anything irrational. And I'm not just talking about taking your own life. I'm talking about running away from your problem. I'm talking about leaving your spouse. I'm talking about ditching your, your, uh, your family. I'm talking about quitting your job. I'm talking about whatever it might be that, that Satan sometimes puts in our minds to give up on things. When you don't know what to do and you don't have clarity on what to do, stay where you're supposed to be, where God has told you to be, until he gives you clarity. And, and uh, there's lots of things that could have happened in this boat right at this moment. Um, you, you guys know about Eddie Aikau. I, I don't have time to explain the story to those of you that are visiting. But you know the story of Eddie. And uh, Eddie made a tragic mistake as they were sailing off of Molokai on the Hokulea back in 1978. I was a senior in high school. And he thought to himself, he, he broke the rule of all watermen, never leave the vessel. And he did. And he struck out on his own, and he took off his life vest, and he got on his board and paddled away, and they never saw him, never found him. It was the largest uh, open sea search in Hawaii's history, and, and Eddie was lost. And what I want to encourage you is you're going through a storm, whether you're in one now or you're headed toward one or you're coming out of one or you just want to have good theology about what to do in one, is that wait on God. Wait on God until you have clarity about what to do. And so Jesus says, don't be afraid. And so uh, Peter, my eager Grom, our eager Grom in the Bible, that's not a bad term, by the way. Uh, This is a guy that's uh, just going for it. This is a guy that doesn't care how young in the Lord he is. He doesn't care about how big the waves are. He's just like, I'm going. And so he says to the Lord, Lord, if it's you, uh, you know, command me to come to you on the water. And actually in the Greek, he's saying, since it is you, command me to come on the water. Now, I I find it interesting, the irony of this text is, is, uh, I think, amazing. Because, as you know, Peter, what does his name mean? Rock or stone, right? So the guy that is like a rock is the guy that gets out of the boat. I mean, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have sent the rock to go walk on water. You know, a lot of biblical scholars have suggested that the story might have turned out a lot differently if Jesus had commanded to come the lesser-known and more buoyant disciple named Bob. (laughs) But that's not how the story went. And so Jesus commanded Peter to come. You know, there's a lot of commands of of, uh, the Bible where Jesus tells us to come. And I want to encourage you. I mean, uh, this whole text could be about getting out of the boat. That's not my intent today. So we'll uh, cover that kind of a message another time. But what I, what I want to encourage you is that God is calling us to come. It's really to come to him. 
It's not so much about walking on water as, as, it, as it is being in the presence of God. Not just being proximate to God, but being intimate with God. And so the text of Scripture tells us that, you know, if you're thirsty, come. If you're spiritually hungry, come. If you need rest for your soul or you're weary and heavy laden, come. If you're seeking salvation from sin, come. That's the invitation. It, it, the adventure is a part of the experience, but walking on water is not the goal. Being with Christ is the goal. That's what drew Peter's heart. He wanted to be with the Lord. Call me to come to you. He didn't say, let me walk on water. He wanted to be with Christ. He's the guy that dives out of the boat, you know, on another occasion to go swim to shore. And uh, we, we find this heart of Peter um, like, a, like an eager grom, in essence, in a, surfing, in a surfing vernacular, just willing to do whatever it took and uh, wanting to be with the Lord. And so we know the story. He comes out of the boat. He walks on water, goes to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he became afraid and he began to sink. And actually, in the text, it means to drown. So we're not talking about just that he was kind of losing his footing. The text actually indicates that he thought that he was drowning. And he cries out to the Lord, which is the best thing he could have done, and he said, save me. You know, there's a, there's a psalm I would encourage you to read at your leisure, Psalm 107. Write that down in your notes on the side, Psalm 107. In Psalm 107, we have the account of the history of Israel. And it really goes all the way back to the, uh, to the inauguration and the dedication of Solomon's temple. And at that dedication, Solomon pray, prays this incredible prayer. And in the midst of that prayer, he, he gives a whole lot of scenarios of all the bad things that could ever happen to the people of Israel. And he says, when these bad things happen and your people cry out, save and deliver. I want to read some of those to you today. In verse 6 of that psalm, they were wandering, hungry, and thirsty. And it says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of all their distresses. In verse 13, when they were exiled as slaves and prisoners as a result of their own rebellion, the text says, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of all of their distresses. In verse 19, when they were afflicted because of their iniquities, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of all their distresses. And when they found themselves in the stormy seas, in 28, then they cried out to the Lord in all their trouble, and he saved them out of all their distresses. And in verse 29 and 30, listen to this, very appropriate for our text today. He calms the storms so that its waves are still, and then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. That's the result of men and women that cry out to God. They wait on God. They're experienced enough and knowledgeable enough about the word of God to know that when they walk in obedience to God, sometimes the storms still accompany them. And in the midst of that, they wait, they're patient, they don't panic, they stay with the boat. And that boat is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God. That's the salvation, going all the way back to the Ark of the Covenant and going all the way back to Noah's Ark. That's the form of deliverance. Our deliverer is Jesus Christ. Don't wander from him. Don't fall out of favor with him. Don't disobey him. Stay in the middle of the storm and stay in the middle of the boat and put your confidence and your trust in God as you wait because God will deliver. And Jesus did. In verse 31, he stretched out his hand and he caught Peter. And he said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? The truth is, is that um, Peter was a man filled with bravado, but his weakness was doubt. That would change over time, as it does with almost every Christian. We, we go from faith to faith. We, we start with faith. It's, it's infant faith. It's baby faith. It's, it's childlike faith. But as we grow in faith, we grow and we are able to put our confidence in more and more difficult situations that God will deliver. How do we grow in faith? Somebody tell me. By hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Do you want to grow in faith? Then you have to be a, peop a people and a person that reads this a lot. If you want to grow a lot in faith, read this a lot. If you want to grow a little in faith, read it a little bit. 
It's really up to you. That's the amazing thing to me about God is that he, he, there's no rules against how much time you can spend with God. Have you ever noticed that? We always, as pastors and as people in the kingdom and as you guys as disciple-making church and you're working with the people you're discipling and winning into Christ, we're always just encouraging people, just spend 10 minutes on the Word of God. But have you ever heard anyone say, now, you know what, I'm a little concerned about you. You know, you seem to be spending an awful lot of time on the Word of God. Oh, yeah, you're doing your job, you're loving your family, but can't you do anything other than read the Bible? What's wrong with you? I mean, that's a discussion that most pastors don't have to have with the people in their church. It's always trying to get people to, to be in the Word. So here's the thing. If you want to be a person that has great faith, that, that is able to surmount these terrible storms that sometimes strike our life right in the middle of our obedience to God, then you've got to be a person that is in this every day. Your marriage needs to be in this every day. Your family life needs to be in this book every day. Your relationships with other people, the church, this is the source of life. This is where our faith grows. As we study this, we become more and more aware and more and more cognizant of the power of God to work in our life. It builds up our faith so that when the moments of, of discouragement or difficulty or the storm comes, then we have faith because we know who God is. And we know the promises of God. And all these things instruct us in the midst of this. It's like a fire drill. You know, that's why we do fire drills. We, we run the drill, we run the drill, we run, run the drill. Why? So that we can be rational in a moment of tragedy or difficulty. Because at those moments, sometimes we can make some terrible decisions and like jump out of the boat on our board with no life vest and think that we're going to make it to shore. When God says, oh no, just stay where you are, wait on the Lord, having done all things, wait on the Lord, be of good cheer as you do it. And so Peter was corrected by the Lord gently in this rebuke. And then we have a remarkable summary in verses 32 through 33 that when Jesus got into the boat, the wind ceased. It just stopped. Psalm 89 says this, O Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Again, this is prophetic of the Messiah. This is more evidence that Jesus is indeed the Son of God who he claimed to be. Well, the disciples, in response to this, they worshiped the Lord and they said, truly, you are the Son of God. This is the first public declaration of the disciples in the Messiahship of Jesus Christ, and they worshiped him. Now, this is an amazing event that took place, very instructive for the disciples, life-transforming, teaches them how to go through storms, <clears throat> teaches them that storms are part of life, teaches them that just because they're walking with God doesn't mean they're exempt, uh, teaches them that life is not fair all the time, sometimes unjust, unexpected, undiscernible, Difficulties enter our lives, and we don't even know why. But it teaches us in the midst of all of that uncertainty and all those difficulties that God is with us, and God has power to deliver, and God has a plan, and God works all things together for the good. It actually serves to advance. These storms that come into the life of a believer advance their, their walk with God if they respond biblically. And so the disciples are responding. They're learning how to do this. In verse 34, they get back on the plan. The plan is fulfilled. They crossed over to the other side, to the land of Gennesaret. And the men of that place recognized Jesus, and they brought to him all that were sick and begged to touch the hem of his garment, this tassel, this fringe of his prayer shawl. This is the same uh, tassel prayer shawl that the woman who had an issue of blood in Matthew 9 touched. You remember this woman? She comes to the Lord, and she's ashamed. She's... Uh, it's technically ceremonial, ceremonially, uh, ceremonially unclean. Wow, I had a hard time saying that. Um, she's unclean, shouldn't be touching anybody, and, but out of desperation because of years of suffering and the loss really of all her finances because she spent every dime she had on medical care. Ooh, that sounds increasingly familiar in the years to come. She spent everything she, she had and she still couldn't be healed. And so in desperation, she, she reached out, and the Bible says that she, she touched the, the hem of Jesus' garment. We're thinking, oh, that's cool. Touch the hem, touch the shoulder, touch his hair, touch his toes. It's all good. But that's not what the text says. It says that he touched the hem. There's something very specific about that. It has to do with the, with the talit, the prayer shawl um, of uh, 
of the Jewish tradition, every Jewish boy on their bar mitzvah would receive a prayer shawl. Part of that prayer shawl would have the tzitzit, would be these, uh, on the four corners of the prayer shawl, these tassels that would hang down. Uh, these tassels, um, each of these four tassels had five knots on them, representing the five books of the Torah, the Old Testament. And those spaces in between represented the holy, unspeakable name of Yahweh, which was pronounced, though it couldn't be pronounced because there were no vowels in it, uh, with four consonants. And so the four spaces bef between the four knots represented the unspeakable, holy name of God. The numerical value of the word tzitzit is 600. This is coming from uh, the Mishnah. I'm not making this stuff up. This is, this is out of the Mishnah, the Jewish writings that accompany the Old Testament scriptures. And when you add up the, the, uh, the numerical value of this word tzitzit, which is 600, and the eight strings that accompany each of these five knots, you come up with 613, which were the commandments of scripture <coughs> of the Old Testament. And so when a, when a Jewish man or woman would wear this, this tallit, this prayer shawl, these, these four uh, accompanying tassels would remind them not only of the Torah and of the wonderful name of God, but also reminded them of the importance of keeping the six, 613 commandments. And so when this woman actually in, in Matthew 9 touched the tzitzit, she was actually expressing faith in the Messiah. Because listen to this. This is really amazing. This is out of Zohar. This is a part of the, uh, the Mishnah of the Jewish tradition. The traditional Jewish teaching said that those who touch the tzitzit of the Messiah's talit, and again, this was prophetic, who touch the tzitzit of the, Mish of the uh, Messiah's talit would be instantly cured of whatever ailed them. This is why this woman in Matthew 9 reached for that tzitzit, the talit. And it's this same talit that the Jews came to touch in Christ. And what they were touching was just physical. It was, a, it, was a, it was a tassel. It had string. It was made of yarn. It had material, and it was dyed. And it had significance, and it had meaning, but ultimately it pointed to the fulfillment of all 613 commandments in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross of Christ so that we could receive a healing and so that we could be forgiven, and so that we could be restored, and we could be saved. So we don't need the prayer shawl of Jesus, and we don't need to touch the seat seat and find some prayer tassel somewhere, nor do we need to wear a prayer shawl or have prayer tassels. What we have in that foreshadowing is the finished work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in essence, says, I am. I, to the exclusion of all others, am alone the one that you need to come to. In the text, we find that they came to, to Jesus. And those that touched, the, the, not Jesus, it says, but as those that touched the hem, this tzitzit, they were made perfectly well. I'm thinking about uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, and I want to read it briefly in verses 14 through 16. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. This avenue is still available. It's interesting that the prayer shawl was the, the, the covering of Christ in his earthly walk. It was, his, it was a part of his identity as a Jew, but it was also significant as his identity as the Messiah. But we don't need to come to a prayer shawl, but we do need to come to Christ. And he says, I'm inviting all of you. He says, come. Again, he says, come. Come to me. Come and seek me. Bring your problems to me. Are you in a crisis? Are you in a storm? Are you confused? Are you tempted to do something irrational? Are you looking uh, for escape? Jesus says, come to me. I can guarantee you that God has the answer for you. I can guarantee you that he has the power to deliver you. I, have, I can guarantee you that, that not only will you survive this if you trust God, but you will be catapulted forward in your walk with God, your maturity with God, your understanding of God, your knowledge of God, and your intimacy with God. But you have to stay with the boat. 
you have to stay with the Messiah. You have to calm yourself and let him calm you with the promises of be, be of good cheer. There's lots of other promises that he gives us as well. Some of you need to, you need to embrace that and, and let the peace of Christ fill your hearts this morning. You need to put your confidence completely in God again. Not that you haven't, but again. I don't know about you, but I find myself, I have to do it almost every day. Sometimes moment by moment. I've got to keep coming back to God and saying, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I don't understand everything, but I'm putting my confidence in you. I know you've got a plan, and I know that you'll work this out for, for the good. Not necessarily my definition of good, but for your good, for your kingdom, for your glory, for your advancement, which is what the book of Matthew is all about. It's about a king, a coming, reigning king. It's about a people, the citizenry of the kingdom of God, and it's about a place, the new heaven and the new earth. That's what this gospel is about. That's what this book is about. That's what this life is about. And everything else finds itself in submission to this eternal plan of God. And those that are wise find themselves in submission to that plan. May God see in us and in you this heart. And may God also take notice of your suffering. May God see your heartache and the pain. May God come to you on the waters of your storm and take you by the hand and draw you to himself and calm the storm. Until that happens, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, take heart, and wait on the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time in your word this morning. And, and Lord, we thank you that you teach us so much through the Bible, that you invite us to pray, you invite us to 